In today's video, I want to talk about how I approach creativity, especially in the context of creating the two games Follow the White Rabbit and Maze for our hacking competition, two games intended to be hacked. I already made a video where I talked about how I started to learn about game development and today I wanted to focus more on the game design. I wouldn't say I'm a super creative person, I don't think I'm particularly special in that area, but I enjoy being creative and I enjoy seeing other people's creativity. That's why I enjoy the demo scene a lot, but also CTFs because they are often creative. And I think creativity is pretty important in IT security, or at least if you are interested in security research. Chapter one, making a plan. Oftentimes when people want to work on any kind of project, be it renovating a kitchen, building a website or making a game, it seems reasonable to first make a plan to then execute the steps. And so it's very common to see that people start making design documents where they plan out all the features of the game and envision what it's supposed to be, possibly spending weeks or months just on that step in making the game more complex and more complex and adding more and more. It's much easier to imagine and fantasize over your game than it is to actually build it. So I didn't do anything like that. Making a plan is incredibly important when there is money on the line, when there are risks associated, when you work with multiple people. If I would have wanted to make an actual game and I quit my job for it or I have to manage a team, a plan is essential for the success. But there are two reasons why I didn't make a plan. First of all, I'm still in the learning process. I still don't know enough about the tool Unity, its capabilities and what is easy and difficult to implement. I'm lacking too much experience to make a reasonable plan. I still consider myself to be in the play around and gathering experience phase. The second reason has to do with creativity. Making a plan and brainstorming with notes is a creative process, but it has a huge disadvantage for me. The mind is limitless. You could imagine anything just like that. You can dream up a game in the size of World of Warcraft with the graphics of Call of Duty and the skill tree of Path of Exile. But that's not realistic. Chapter 2. Being creative. I'm a huge fan of creative limitation. The concept of purposely limiting yourself to actually drive creativity. And so by working with Unity and playing around more, I'm creating a limited environment for myself. While using Unity, I notice things that are easy and things that are difficult or not possible. And then that guides a creative process. I like to imagine this like wandering around in fog in a forest with multiple paths. I always see a bit of a path ahead, but I only slowly uncover as I move forward. And once in a while, I see a crossroad and I peek into the directions and choose the one that looks interesting. So I don't need a big map of the forest to walk in it. I don't need a step-by-step -step plan. I just really need to make sure I have my eyes open so I can always see the next few steps and I'm open to divert from the current path. After I did a lot of playing around with Unity, the stuff I talked about in the last video, I thought I'm ready to try out making the game, whatever it's gonna be. So what were my next steps to ignite the creative process? Chapter three, kickstart creativity. If you look at the names of the project I started next, it was called Blocky. The reason for that was that I didn't have a plan yet, but I thought as a good practice, I could re-implement something. For example, the Blocky challenge from Point Adventure 3. That was a crazy challenge. You find a link to my solution for it in the description. You had 32 input switches and then a huge network of connections and you had to enter the correct combination of switches to open the door and get to the flag. Anyway. Sometimes it makes sense to copy something, but make it your own, be transformative, have a twist to it, do it differently. I wasn't sure yet what my version would look like, but I don't worry about that. I'm just getting started with something. I also realized that the amazing islands that I built during testing were way too big for me. I would love to have a big island, but I think it takes too much time to populate. So I created this new blocky project and of course I had to start by making a new island with Gaia and try to create some interesting landscape. But before I could really get into the blocky idea, I got one of those crossroads in the forest and had a creative inspiration. Chapter 4. Fall damage. Remember the experiments with my character controller? At some point I realized maybe I should implement that the player dies when falling from too high up. And so I realized that could be used as the first challenge. What if I make a map where a player is forced to jump down and die and the flag is on the island so you need to hack the game to survive this jump, either teleport or make yourself invulnerable. So I had a first idea to pursue. At this point I was still more 
thinking towards a fantasy style game like Pwn Adventure. I thought maybe we are an apprentice in a wizard's tower and the wizard tells you to jump down to find the powerful spell. And the magic spells are basically the hacking stuff. So you need to learn to hack the game to reach the goal. And then when you succeed, the wizard would be super proud that you broke through the layers of the universe or something like that. But while I was building, I also realized that I didn't really have a lot of fantasy assets and had more of futuristic stuff. So instead I decided to have a floating spaceship instead. I also play Apex Legends a lot and of course I'm familiar with other battle royale games like Fortnite and so I thought it would be funny if the game starts like a Fortnite game. You fly in in the battle bus over the island, then you drop out, you drop and drop, but you don't have a glider, so boom, you die. I thought that would be funny. I looked up how the battle bus looks like and tried to make one with the assets I had. You know, I didn't want to get into 3D modeling myself, but I figured out quickly that I couldn't get a cool balloon. So instead I made some kind of spaceship. If you have played Maze and you found the hangar, you might have even seen this ship. I spent so much time building it that after I abandoned this map, I didn't want it to go to waste, so I included it there. Here's the first test map. And it started with this flying camera. Ooh, looks cool, right? You start in the ship, and then you walk to the door, it opens, but you see no other choice than to jump. You did. But if you manage to hack and manipulate the game, then you would be on the ground, you could follow the path into the cave, and around this corner, there you can find the first flag. Chapter 5. Flags in offline games. When I added the first test flag, I realized how difficult it is to make a hackable game and hide those flags, especially in an offline game. Note that at this point in time, I had no plans on making an online game, like Maze ended up to be. I thought I never have time for that, so I was stuck with building the flags in a local game. And so something you have to keep in mind when you add a flag like this, it's a texture, an image, which can easily be extracted with any Unity game hacking tool. You would not even have to launch the game to get it. Even if you write code that draws this flag, people will still reverse engineer that code and then it's a code reversing challenge, not a game hacking challenge. So for making challenges, it's important to understand this limitation and work around it. Also I thought, as a game hacking introduction challenge, this is actually not too bad. Now there are multiple ways to solve this flag. Make yourself immortal by patching out the death functions, teleport around with cheat engine, or use static tools to find the texture. Cool. Of course I wanted to have more flags, a whole island full of flags to discover, and had no real idea how to do that yet. But I figured I just kept going and maybe I get another inspiration. Chapter 6. 3D Modeling while working on my character controller, I was wondering which model to use. I had a nice selection from Cinti, but I couldn't decide. An obvious go-to, which you can also see in the first episode of my Pwn Adventure playlist, the casual let's play, I picked a character with a stereotypical black hoodie. So I wanted a character with a black hoodie. Unfortunately, Cinti didn't have a good one. It did have a hoodie character, but it wasn't a black hoodie and also not a fitting head. I was more leaning towards this head. I think that kind of looks like me. So I used this opportunity to learn a bit of Blender and 3D modeling. My goal was to stitch these two models together, as well as changing the color of the hoodie. Now, this was a mess and it's not perfect. Some of the details are kind of botched, but I succeeded. I had a character with a black hoodie now. Awesome, but what do I do with it now? Chapter 7. Alternative Story I already mentioned my ideas of the wizard theme and the Fortnite Battle Royale theme, but then I made this stereotypical hacker character. And so I have to do something with that. While continuing building islands and fixing code, I try to think of some interesting story with that. At least a theme I could build from. And you know, I don't want to do the stereotypical hacking shit. I don't want to just have another kind of anonymous or secret hacking bunker. I don't want to make Mr. Robot or something. I enjoy the hacking stereotypes, but I don't need to overdo it. And if I put something out, maybe it could be a bit more thoughtful. And then at some point I was thinking, hmm, this character just looks like a stereotypical white dude in brown pants and a black hoodie. You already watch one here in this video. Do you really need another game to identify with? What if I turn the stereotypes around? So I thought, fuck Gamergate and we make the player character a badass woman hacker who has to save the helpless nerd sitting in front of his computer and he's getting jealous that she's better at hacking than him. I thought that would be a cool idea and even started making a dark room with the guy typing there on the computer. 
Eventually, I scrapped that idea because I realized that I have no time to make a story and this robot character has no gender anyway, uh, so maybe someday. Chapter 9, Technical Issues. I split the video in parts. Basically, the video where I share how I learned game development with Unity and it's a bit more technical, and then this one, which is more about the game design. But of course, this game development process still has tons of technical issues, and it's a continuous learning process. I just wanted to emphasize that I didn't magically become a professional here. I learned more and more about Unity. I just felt like I know enough to try making a first game myself, which could be the hacking game. I want to highlight one example issue that I ran into when making this cave with the first flag. When I dug into the terrain and then later added the water, I realized the cave was underwater. Of course, you could solve this problem by simply making a game design decision. Any cave just happens to be above water, and that's a totally fine solution. But I also tried to see if I could somehow solve it. I was using Crest for water, and there existed great tutorials, as well as a very helpful Discord. And there I learned that Crest has a feature where you can define a water input and it basically forces the water up and down. And so here I just made a flat surface and forced the water down. There are too many issues to mention that continuously popped up. I just wanted to make clear that this is still part of making a game. Chapter 10, a new island. I'm not really sure what prompted me to abandon this island because I did like what I made here, but I think it was just the size of it. It was still a big playground because I learned here how to use digger to dig the cave, crest with the water inputs, lighting inside the cave, and also using nature renderer. So eventually I created a new island, a smaller one, and called it Flagland. And this eventually became the first hackable game I made. At the start, I still called it Flagland, but later I renamed it to Follow the White Rabbit. So first of all, the island is smaller and I didn't use the spaceship for the player to fall down. The main reason was that when you are high up, you already see the entire map. It would kind of spoil it. I wanted the player to discover and explore the island. The same feeling I had when I started Pony Adventure in the cave and came out and found this big island to explore. So on this new map, I moved the fall damage challenge into this pit. You jump down and at the bottom you find this cave which leads you to the flag. Cool. I decided the player starts here on this bridge, just arrived here with a small spaceship and then has the choice to go right or left. But this fall damage challenge is very easy and so I wanted the player to go there first. But how do you do that? And this is where I had another inspiration. I saw these polygon animals and there was a white rabbit and I thought the white rabbit could guide the player to the flag. This way the player also doesn't have to guess where the flags are hidden. The White Rabbit is obviously a cool reference. Many people know it from Matrix, but it's coming from Alice's adventure in Wonderland, where Alice follows the White Rabbit into a hole to enter this amazing world. And isn't this a beautiful fit here? Follow the White Rabbit into the hole, learn hacking, and enter this wonderful world of IT security. Chapter 11, making NPCs. With the White Rabbits, I also faced a new development challenge. How do you make an NPC character to move when you get close and move on a specific path and also have the fitting animations? It really took me a while to solve this and I'm not sure if I did it in a good way. In the end, I bought a tool called Spline Plus, which you can use to draw waypoints and then have game objects follow it. But the terrain is bumpy and there are stones. But this tool has a projection feature where it would simply place the game object on any ground it finds under the selected path. I was also thinking of developing something like that myself or would have hoped this exists within Unity, but I had to balance my time and cost and I just found being able to place waypoints like this is very useful. However, it did not solve all my problems and I did write some more code for it, which I think would be an awesome feature if it was added to Spline Plus. I basically created an event system because I wanted the bunny to start running when the player gets close, then stop again, sit and clean itself waiting for the player to get closer again, and then also trigger the jump animation at the right point. So in this rabbit controller that I wrote, you can add events to a list. An event simply defines when it fires, that's the progress value, how far on the path the game object traveled, and a Unity event to trigger. And so when the player gets close, the spine following gets activated, and then the bunny starts running. It runs until a distance of 59.2, and then it executes the function state 2 first pause, this sets the animation of the rabbit to idle so it doesn't run anymore and sits down and it disables the path following for the object. 
It also activates a trigger feature, which means when the player gets close again, the rabbit starts running, following the path again. Anyway, that was my solution to the problem. I liked the event system I thought of, but of course I still had to buy an asset. I would be really curious how other people make scripted events with NPCs. I tried to look for videos about this topic, but couldn't really find any. Chapter 12, the second flag. At this point in time, I still only had the first and I was unsure what the next flag could be. The main issue for me was the texture because I didn't want a second flag to be solved by simply extracting the image. So I had to force players to do it dynamically in game. And for that reason, I had to create the flag at runtime and hide the parts so well that static analysis makes no sense. This is the flag and it assembled out of various different pieces. The CSCG string is from the first flag but the other texts are taken from Sinti assets and layered them in a way to create new words. And one last component was regular text renderer, but also generated from code by doing a simple XOR decryption. I called this class partial flag 2 because I knew that the names for classes and functions are still inside the compiled game and can easily be decompiled. Players will discover this class. So I wanted to make sure that players don't try to solve this challenge statically and that they have to hack in game. And I attempted this by telling them the flag is probably hard to get statically, so maybe try a dynamic approach. And the name of this integer is, it's only part of the flag, try a different approach. Just to make this very clear, I don't want players to get frustrated here. Here's how this function looks like decompiled. Some of my messages got lost, I guess optimized out, but the important function name still exists. Hopefully this is enough guidance for the players. And so I simply had the flag hidden inside this house, but no way to get in. I also attempted to make a cool branchy jump path inspired by movies or other games, but I kind of failed. I'm not good at level design. It really looks like shit, but it doesn't matter. Also, I added the bunnies to guide the players to the second flag and the storyline was basically the player now walks to the other direction, find another bunny and follow it, but reaches the closed gate. Now here you have to do a teleport hack or you, you are clever and you find a way to jump in. I actually found this during testing because I also got annoyed at the closed gate. But I also know that other people found that too. Then you walk up the path, very much fun, and you see that the bunny slips through the gate and you know where to go. Now you could simply teleport yourself inside and you find the flag. And so basically you have the easy flag you can find with static analysis or the flag where you actually need to hack something. Cool. Chapter 13. Playtesting. Now that I have my first two flags of the game hacking challenge ready, I created a first test release and gave it to some of the other hacking competition organizers just to see how they do it. And of course they solved it, all fine, it wasn't a hard challenge. Also got a few bug reports and recommendations that I wanted to add, but there was one issue. Flag 1 and 2 are both solvable with simply using cheat engine to teleport around. So if somebody used it to solve the first flag, the second flag is the same. That's a bit boring. Chapter 14. Out of ideas. I tried to think of other challenges, but I kind of got stuck. So let's recap the limitations. First of all, there's this tool Cheat Engine, which I have used several times before on this channel and is awesome at dynamically searching memory for interesting variables and that can be used in basically any game to modify anything. So modifying player's position, essentially teleporting, is easy. But also anything else like owning specific items or having a certain amount of gold, it's all easy to manipulate. On top of that, Unity games are written in C Sharp and that makes it very, very trivial to decompile and even modify with tools like the NSPY. So I knew any kind of code I write is immediately found, read and modified in case it helps the players. So I can't really hide much in it. In games that are written in something like C++, it requires a bit more effort because you have to use disassemblers to read the code, but still doesn't protect from cheaters. But for a challenge, it would make it a bit more challenging, but we are stuck with C Sharp. I also know that there are plenty of Unity specific tools that make reverse engineering Unity games very easy. They can even kind of reverse a whole project so you can open it up in Unity again. It's insane. By the way, that's also the reason why I released this game for the competition only on Windows. Even though I could have it compiled for Linux and Mac as well. The tooling, so the Unity reverse engineering tools on Windows are just so good that anybody who would try to solve the challenges on Linux or Mac would have it 10 times harder. By only releasing Windows, it might suck for a few players who have to install a VM, but this way I can force them to explore the crazy tooling on Windows and make their lives actually easier. 
Anyway, I didn't really see a lot of options for more challenges. I felt like any other challenge I would make would turn into a shitty guessing obfuscation challenge. But if I had an online game where the server is responsible for handing out the flags, the code is fully in my control and I could implement a lot more. So it slowly dawned on me. Fuck, maybe I should make an online game. Chapter 15, finalizing follow the white rabbit. At some point, I had another inspiration how I could change the second flag. The idea basically comes from what people call data mining. Every time when a popular game releases an update, people data mine the game and try to find hints or leaks of upcoming content. And so I thought that could be turned into a challenge. Unity games are divided up into multiple scenes. Typically each level would be its own scene. And when you compile your Unity game, you need to add the scenes you want to include, which means Maybe you accidentally include the scene of an update that is not actually playable yet. Unity can also load multiple scenes at once. And so I basically removed the house and put it into its own empty scene. On the island, I then transformed the area into a construction site, hinting that a future game update would add something here. So in order to solve this challenge now, players need to figure out that there is another scene in this game and somehow load it. For example, by modifying the game to force loading the scene. In order to minimize the guessing and provide a bit more direction what players have to look for, I also created an epic trailer of this game, hinting about this update and showing the house. I was hoping it would make people wonder, if the flag is in this house, added in a future update, and in the version I have, it's not there yet, then maybe this update leaked into this release. And then maybe you research how levels can be structured in Unity and you learn about scenes. So these two flags, the falling down and the data mining one, became the game hacking introductory challenge for our competition. That's follow the white rabbit. I'm actually pretty proud of this. This is my first game. I still had some bugs. I later found out like the audio volume is broken, but whatever, I'm not selling it, so I don't really care. Like I already said, I realized that I might want to make an online game after all. Now I also had a bit more confidence that I would be able to do this because at this point I have the basic Unity knowledge and can make simple 3D games. All I would need now is some kind of server and networking component to have clients interact with each other. I started on this new game, what would later become Maze, even before I finalized this challenge, but I decided to include the steps here so the next video will be about making this online game.